a lever that, when pressed, would open a door, enabling escape. Thorndike then took the cats that had successfully escaped and repeated the experiment. His findings? Well, after being put in the box a few times, each cat learned the trick. Rather than scrambling around for a minute or more, the cats went straight for the lever. After 20 or 30 attempts, the average cat could escape in just six seconds. In other words, the process of getting out of the box had become habitual. Thorndike had discovered that behaviors that give satisfying consequences, in this case gaining freedom, tend to be repeated until they become automatic. Like cats in the 19th century, we also stumble across satisfying solutions to life's difficulties and predicaments. And thankfully, we now understand a little more about how habits work. Habits begin with a cue or a trigger to act. Walking into a dark room cues you to perform an action that will enable sight. Next comes a craving for a change in state, in this case, to be able to see. Then comes our response or action, flicking the light switch. The final step in the process and the end goal of every habit is the reward. Here, it's the feeling of mild relief and comfort that comes from being able to see your surroundings. Every habit is subject to the same process. Do you habitually drink coffee every morning? Waking up is your cue, triggering a craving to feel alert. Your response is to drag yourself out of bed and make a cup of joe. Your reward is feeling alert and ready to face the world. But of course, not all habits are good for us. Now that we understand how habits work, let's look at building positive ones that improve our lives. Blink number three. Building new habits requires hard-to-miss cues and a plan of action. All of us have cues that trigger certain habits. The buzz of your phone, for example, is a cue to check your messages. And once you understand that certain stimuli can prompt habitual behavior, you can use this knowledge to change your habits. How? Well, one way is to change your surroundings and general environment to encourage better habits. Just take the work of Boston-based Dr. Anne Thorndike. She wanted to improve her patients' dietary habits without requiring them to make a conscious decision. How did she pull this off? She had the hospital cafeteria rearranged. Originally, the refrigerators next to the cash registers contained only soda. Thorndike introduced water, not only there, but at every other drink station. Over three months, soda sales dropped by 11%, while water sales shot up by 25%. People were making healthier choices just because the cue to drink water rather than soda was more prominent. So, simple changes to our environment can make a big difference. Want to practice guitar? Leave the instrument out in the center of the room. Trying to eat healthier snacks? Leave them out on the counter instead of in the salad drawer. Make your cues as obvious as possible, and you'll be more likely to respond to them. A second great way to strengthen cues is to use implementation intentions. Most of us tend to be too vague about our intentions. We say, I'm going to eat better, and simply hope that we'll follow through. An implementation intention introduces a clear plan of action, setting out when and where you'll carry out the habit you'd like to cultivate. And research shows that it works. A study of voters in the United States found that the citizens who were asked the questions at what time will you vote and how will you get to the voting station were more likely to actually turn out than those who were just asked if they would vote. So don't just say, I'll run more often. Say, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, when the alarm goes off, the first thing I'll do is don my running gear and clock two miles. Then leave your running shoes out where you'll see them. You'll be giving yourself both a clear plan and an obvious cue, and it may surprise you how much easier this will make it to actually build a positive running habit. Blink number four. Humans are motivated by the anticipation of reward, so making habits attractive will help you stick to them. In 1954, neuroscientists James Olds and Peter Milner ran an experiment to test the neurology of desire. Using electrodes, they blocked the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine in rats. To their surprise, the rats simply lost the will to live. They had no desire to eat, 
drink, reproduce, or do anything else. Mere days later, they all died of thirst. The human brain releases dopamine, a hormone that makes us feel good, when we do pleasurable things such as eating or having sex. But we also get a hit of feel-good dopamine when we simply anticipate those pleasurable activities. It's the brain's way of driving us onward and encouraging us to actually do things. So in the brain's reward system, desiring something is on par with getting something, which goes a long way toward explaining why kids enjoy the anticipation of Christmas so much. It's also why daydreaming about your upcoming hot date is so pleasurable. We can also turn this knowledge to our advantage when trying to form habits. If we make a habit something we look forward to, we'll be much more likely to follow through and actually do it. A great technique for this is temptation bundling. This is where you take a behavior that you think of as important but unappealing and link it to a behavior that you're drawn to, one that will generate that motivating dopamine hit. Ronan Byrne, an engineering student in Ireland, knew he should exercise more, but he got little enjoyment from working out. However, he did enjoy watching Netflix, so he hacked an exercise by connecting it to his laptop and writing code that would only allow Netflix to run if he was cycling at a certain speed. By linking exercise literally to a behavior that he was naturally drawn to, he transformed a distasteful activity into a pleasurable one. You don't need to be an engineer to apply this to your life. If you need to work out but you want to catch up on the latest A-list gossip, you can commit to only reading magazines while at the gym. If you want to watch sports but you need to make sales calls, promise yourself a half hour of ESPN after you talk to your 10th prospect. Soon enough, you may even find those unattractive tasks enjoyable, since you'll be anticipating a pleasing reward while carrying them out. Blink number five. If you want to build a new habit, make that habit as easy to adopt as possible. We often spend a lot of time on behaviors that are easy. Scrolling through social media, for example, takes zero effort, so it's easy for it to fill up lots of our time. Doing a hundred push-ups or studying Mandarin Chinese, in contrast, requires a lot of effort. Repeating those behaviors daily until they become habitual is tough. So making behaviors as easy as possible is key to turning them into habits. Luckily, there are a few tricks we can embrace to make anything seem easier. The first is to focus on reducing friction. The author has always been hopeless at sending greeting cards, while his wife never fails to do so. Why? Well, she keeps a box of greeting cards at home, pre-sorted by occasion, making it easier to send congratulations or condolences or whatever is called for. Since she doesn't have to go out and buy a card when someone gets married or has an accident, there's no friction involved in sending one. You can also use this approach to increase friction for bad habits. If you want to waste less time in front of the TV, unplug it and take the batteries out of the remote. Doing so will introduce enough friction to ensure you only watch when you really want to. The second trick for making a habit easier in the long term is the two-minute rule a way to make any new activity feel manageable. The principle is that any activity can be distilled into a habit that is doable within two minutes. Want to read more? Don't commit to reading one book every week. Instead, make a habit of reading two pages per night. Want to run a marathon? Commit to simply putting on your running gear every day after work. The two-minute rule is a way to build easily achievable habits, and those can lead you on to greater things. Once you've pulled on your running shoes, you'll probably head out for a run. Once you've read two pages, you'll likely continue. The rule recognizes that simply getting started is the first and most important step toward doing something. Now, let's take a look at the final rule for using habits to improve your life. Blink number six. Making your habits immediately satisfying is essential to effective behavior change. In the 1990s, public health researcher Stephen Luby, working in the neighborhood of Karachi, Pakistan, achieved a huge 52% reduction in diarrhea among the local children. Pneumonia rates dropped by 48% and skin infections by 35%. Luby's secret? 
nice soap. Luby had known that hand washing and basic sanitation were essential to reducing illness. The locals understood this too, they just weren't turning their knowledge into a habit. Everything changed when Luby worked with Procter and Gamble to introduce a premium soap into the neighborhood for free. Overnight, hand washing became a satisfying experience. The new soap lathered easily and smelled delightful. Suddenly, everyone was washing their hands because it was now a pleasing activity. The final and most important rule for behavioral change is to make habits satisfying. This can be difficult for evolutionary reasons. Today, we live in what academics call a delayed return environment. You turn up at the office today, but the return, a paycheck, doesn't come until the end of the month. You go to the gym in the morning, but you don't lose weight overnight. Our brains, though, evolved to cope with the immediate return environment of earlier humans, who weren't thinking about long-term returns like saving for retirement or sticking to a diet. They were focused on immediate concerns like finding their next meal, seeking shelter, and staying alert enough to escape any nearby lions. Immediate returns can encourage bad habits, too. Smoking may give you lung cancer in 20 years, but in the moment, it relieves your stress and the craving for nicotine, which means you may ignore the long-term effects and indulge in a cigarette. So, when you are pursuing habits with a delayed return, try to attach some immediate gratification to them. For example, a couple the author knows wanted to eat out less, cook more, get healthier, and save money. To do so, they opened a savings account called Trip to Europe, and every time they avoided a meal out, transferred $50 to it. The short-term satisfaction of seeing $50 land in that savings account provided the immediate gratification they needed to keep them on track for the ultimate longer-term reward. However pleasurable and satisfying we make habits, we may still fail to maintain them. So let's take a look at how we can stick to our good intentions. Blink number seven. Create a framework to keep your habits on track using trackers and contracts. Whether you're trying to write your journal or give up smoking, managing your own behaviors can be hard. Thankfully, there are a few simple measures that can help. Habit tracking is a simple but effective technique. Many people have kept a record of their habits. One of the most well-known is founding father Benjamin Franklin. From the age of 20, Franklin kept a notebook in which he recorded adherence to 13 personal virtues, which included aims like avoiding frivolous conversation and to always be doing something useful. He noted his success every night. You too can develop a habit tracker using a simple calendar or diary and crossing off every day that you stick with your chosen behaviors. You'll find it effective because habit tracking itself is an attractive and satisfying habit. The anticipation and action of crossing off each day will feel good and keep you motivated. A second technique is to develop a habit contract that imposes negative consequences if you fail to stay on track. Brian Harris, an entrepreneur from Nashville, took his habit contract very seriously. In a contract signed by him, his wife, and his personal trainer, he committed to get his weight down to 200 pounds. He identified specific habits that would help get him there including tracking his food intake each day and weighing himself each week. Then he set up penalties for not doing those things. If he failed to track food intake, he would have to pay $100 to his trainer. If he failed to weigh himself, he would owe $500 to his wife. The strategy worked, driven not just by his fear of losing money, but by his fear of losing face in front of two people who mattered to him. Humans are social animals. We care about the opinions of those around us, so simply knowing that someone is watching you can be a powerful motivator for success. So why not set yourself a habit contract? Even if it isn't as detailed as Harris's, consider making a commitment to your partner, your best friend, or one of your coworkers. If you agree upon a set of consequences for failing to follow through, you'll be much more likely to stick to your habits. And as we've seen, sticking to a positive habit, however small, is a surefire way to achieve big things in life. Thanks for listening to our Blinks to Atomic Habits by James Clear. 
The Blink's main takeaway is that a tiny change in your behavior will not transform your life overnight. But turn that behavior into a habit that you perform every day, and it absolutely can lead to big changes. Changing your life is not about making big breakthroughs or revolutionizing your entire life. Rather, it's about building a positive system of habits that, when combined, deliver remarkable results. Want some more actionable advice? Use habit stacking to introduce new behaviors. If you want to build a new habit, you could try stacking it on top of an existing habit. Let's say you want to start meditating, but you're struggling to find the time. Try thinking about those things you do effortlessly each day, like drinking coffee in the morning. Then just stack the new habit on top. Commit to meditating each morning when you've finished your coffee and build on the natural momentum that comes from a habit you already have. Tom Vanderbilt, Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. Narrated by Thomas Florio and Amanda Marr. Each of us is born into the world with lots of potential, but very few skills. So, it's only natural that the first years of our lives are dedicated to learning. We learn to walk, talk, and even eat. Then, we spend more than a decade honing our talents in school. And then what? For many of us, the drive to pick up new skills wanes in adulthood. However, it doesn't have to be that way. Learning could be a journey that lasts a lifetime. Journalist Tom Vanderbilt made it a personal quest to reignite his long-lost love of always learning something new. These blinks draw on his experience. They mix insights from the fields of psychology and neuroscience to explore how people develop new skills later in life. Along the way, they demonstrate the benefits of always remaining a beginner. Blink One of Seven Tom Vanderbilt had a steady career as a journalist. But when his daughter was born, he quickly discovered that he now had a second job. He became a teacher. As Vanderbilt found, when you're a parent, you're always teaching your children new skills. First come the basics, like walking and talking. And as they grow, you move on to more complex tasks, like riding a bike, cooking, and navigating social situations. As Vanderbilt taught his daughter all these essential skills, he realized something about himself. He hadn't learned a new skill in years. So, he decided to change that. He challenged himself to learn a few completely new things, including chess and surfing. Vanderbilt soon understood that being a beginner again came with lots of benefits. The key message here is, lifelong learning keeps your mind engaged, whatever your age. We never really stop learning. Even minor activities like reading the news or watching television give our brains new information. However, this form of learning merely gives us declarative knowledge. Facts, figures, even trivia. But not all knowledge is like that. There's another kind, one which the author calls procedural knowledge. It helps us actually do something, speak a language, play an instrument, or execute a technical skill. As we grow older, we tend to learn fewer and fewer procedural things. But there was a time when every one of us was great at gaining new procedural knowledge. That time was childhood. Kids see the world with fresh eyes. They bring no preconceived notions to new activities. And this means that there's nothing to hold them back. Another important thing is that society doesn't expect children to be experts at anything. This makes kids far less worried about failure or appearing clumsy. And then, finally, their brains are simply wired to learn. The average seven-year-old has 30% more neurons available for soaking up new information than the average adult. However, 
While adult brains are perhaps less nimble, they still retain plasticity. This term refers to our ability to change and learn. In fact, continuing to learn new skills as you age is fantastic for your mental health. Studies have found that when older adults practice new skills, like painting or writing music, they also improve in general cognitive tests. Even if you only focus on mastering one new activity, you'll still open up your brain to more learning in the future. We'll explore one new skill, singing, in the next blink. Blink two of seven. When was the last time you sang? Did you do a little crooning this morning in the shower? Or perhaps you hummed along to the radio while driving to work? Maybe you've recently belted out a pop classic at a karaoke bar. It seems that humans are just wired to sing. However, most of us don't feel confident about our vocal abilities. In fact, when scientists at the University of California wanted to study embarrassment, they asked people to perform the doo-wop hit, My Girl. So, if you blush whenever people ask you to sing, you're not alone. But it doesn't have to be this way. With dedicated practice, anyone can learn to hold a tune. The key message here is, singing is a skill that can be learned with practice. The ability to sing well is often treated as something innate, like blue eyes or brown hair. We either have it or we don't. But don't despair. Singing's just a motor skill, like riding a bike or typing. Humans produce sound by pushing air through our vocal folds, a series of stretchy muscles inside the throat. By tightening or loosening them, you make the air vibrate at different frequencies. And that changes our voice's pitch. For the average male, the folds vibrate 120 times per second. When an opera singer hits a dramatic high note, her folds go up to 1,400 times per second. So, hitting the right notes and carrying a melody is merely a matter of coordinating your muscles and breathing correctly. This can be difficult for beginners as they're not used to doing this consciously. Where do you start, then? Well, most vocal lessons begin with exercises designed to help students reconsider their bodies. The aim is to look at the body as a musical instrument. This can involve making lots of strange, loose sounds like oohs and ahs. Of course, this process can be a bit embarrassing, especially considering that, according to surveys, most of us hate the sound of our own voice. So, people often hold back or try to sing softly. Unfortunately, this will only make learning harder. The best singers throw their whole body into their performance. If you, too, want a voice that really resonates, you'll have to give it your all. And it'll probably work best if you do it together with other like-minded people, as we'll see in the next Blink. Blink 3 of 7. Walk through Manhattan's Lower East Side on a Monday night, and you might hear something strange. It'll start softly, but as you stroll down Rivington Street, the sound will become louder and louder. When you reach the Clemente Sotovelez Cultural and Educational Center, all will become clear. What you're hearing is 50 people belting out the 1995 Oasis classic, Wonderwall. Meet the Britpop Choir. They're an amiable pack of amateur vocalists, and they gather each week to sing songs that used to top the UK's charts. Together, they worked through yesterday's hits from artists like Blur, Pulp, and David Bowie. While the choir's members have a variety of backgrounds and skill levels, their differences don't really matter. What actually counts is that they've all come together to sing in unison. The key message here is, developing new skills works best as a social practice. While it's possible to cultivate a new skill like singing all on your own, practicing in a social setting comes with many advantages. For one, participating in a group activity, like singing in a choir, 
taps into the innate human desire for social bonding. When people work together to harmonize and breathe in unison, their stress levels drop. And they also benefit from an increase in the production of oxytocin, a hormone connected to happiness. But the benefits don't end there. Practicing in front of others or in a group can also boost your performance. Humans learn best by observing others and getting feedback. Singing in a group allows you to do both at the same time. You hear the voices all around you, and you constantly coordinate your own tone and pitch with the rest of the choir. The increase in ability that comes from working in a group is called social facilitation, and it's not just limited to rehearsal rooms. The social psychologist Norman Triplett first observed it in the world of sports. He found that professional cyclists always achieved their best times when riding together with others. Singing in a choir is one of humanity's oldest and most popular group activities. So, if you want to sharpen your skills, you'd probably really benefit from joining a local club. Alternatively, you can get help from the internet. Apps like Smule allow amateur singers from around the world to practice together, wherever they are. Log on, and in a matter of minutes, you could be singing a duet with someone from Sweden or Indonesia. Don't worry if your voice isn't perfect at first. Learning isn't always a smooth process, as we'll find out in the next Blink. Blink 4 of 7 Imagine yourself out at the beach, bobbing in the water just offshore. You've been taking surfing lessons all week, and now, after hours of practice, you're starting to feel more confident. So, as the next wave comes, you spring into action. First, you paddle along the growing swell. Next, you train your eyes on the shore and steady your body. And finally, as the wave crests, you push down and pop yourself into a crouch. For a moment, it all goes as planned. Then, suddenly, you come toppling down into the water. What went wrong? You followed your instructor's advice perfectly. As it turns out, that rigid adherence to the rules is exactly what sent you plummeting face down into the waves. The key message here is, learning the basic rules is just the first step in a long journey. University of California professors Stewart and Hubert Dreyfus spent decades studying how adults learn new skills. They examined everyone from fighter pilots to chess players and they found that skill acquisition usually comes in five steps. People start as novices, and then progress through the stages. First, you're an advanced beginner. Then come competence, proficiency, and finally, expertise. And making the jump from novice to advanced beginner is harder than it seems. To become a novice, all you need to do is get the basic rules right. A novice chess player learns how pieces move. A novice surfer picks up the textbook procedure for mounting a board and riding a wave. On paper, this works great. But to become an advanced beginner, you must begin to use your new skills in the complex and messy real world. Consider what it's like to learn a new language. At first, you'll make rapid progress picking up vocabulary and memorizing grammar. Yet, talk to a native speaker, and you'll quickly realize just how many exceptions and irregularities you still need to master. English learners will probably remember the frustration of discovering that the past tense of speak is not speaked, but spoke. So, while becoming a novice is easy, stepping up to the advanced beginner stage can be a great deal harder. Because of this, people learning any new skill often become frustrated by their sudden lack of progress and give up early. In surfing, only 5% come back after their first lessons. Yet, with patience and dedication, you can get over this initial hump and begin to really improve your skills. Blink 5 of 7 Let's say you're riding your bike down the street and suddenly a ball bounces into your path. To avoid a disastrous collision, you need, 
to turn left. Sounds easy. After all, all you have to do is turn the handlebars. Well, not exactly. Before you jerk your wheel to the left, you must lean your body to the right. This subtle movement redistributes your weight and keeps you balanced. Of course, as a skilled cyclist, you'll do this automatically. Unconscious actions like these are at the heart of any technical ability. Learning a new skill is often about becoming so proficient that the nuances fade into the background. The key message here is, to master a skill, practice it until the movements become automatic. Scientists who study learning love to use juggling as a test case. It's a simple skill that nearly anyone can learn. Plus, it's easy to practice and monitor in a laboratory setting. So, while the act of repeatedly tossing and catching balls may seem straightforward, it can actually reveal a lot about how we develop talents. For one, scientists find that overthinking can be a strong barrier to acquiring skills. When trying a new task like juggling, people work hard. They try to remain conscious of every movement they make, whether it's throwing a ball into the air, tracking, or catching it. Distributing focus like this can overwhelm the brain. But for more experienced jugglers, the basic movements come unconsciously. This frees their mind to focus on the overall juggling pattern. So, what's the best way to learn? The answer is observing and doing. They are so much more beneficial than simply receiving instruction. In one experiment, Scientists followed two groups of beginner jugglers. One group received a detailed written guide, while the other got to watch juggling videos. Guess which group was more successful? That's right, it was the people who watched other jugglers, not those who just read a textbook. Watching someone else fulfill a task and then trying it out for yourself engages the brain in a special way, and that really helps us learn. As you practice a new skill or even just intently watch someone else do it, you build new neurological connections. You develop something that's often called muscle memory. But really, it's your brain that's doing the heavy lifting. We'll explore this more in the next Blink. Blink 6 of 7 In 2017, Google released a list of the most popular searches which began with the phrase how to. Topping the list was how to tie a tie, followed by other practical queries such as how to write a cover letter and how to lose weight. Curiously, fifth on the list was something a little more whimsical. A lot of people searched for how to draw. Now, drawing is one of the first activities we pick up as children. Nearly every kindergarten offers kids crayons and markers, so, if we all start out like this, why do so many people feel incapable of drawing? Surely most adults have finer motor skills than toddlers. Well, as it turns out, the problem isn't physical coordination. The key message here is, learning to draw is all about learning how to see the world with fresh eyes. If you haven't drawn since school, you're probably not confident in your abilities. And, unfortunately, your hesitance might be justified. Attempt a self-portrait. You probably wouldn't be surprised if it came out all lopsided and disproportionate. Why is drawing a realistic face such a challenge? One issue is that we draw the world as we imagine it, not how it actually appears. A famous study illustrates how this works. In it, participants saw a simple picture of two circles connected by a line. Scientists then separated people into two groups and asked them to reproduce the drawing from memory. But there was one key difference. One group was told the picture depicted a dumbbell, the other group a pair of glasses. In the end, each group's drawings were radically different. Their sketches resembled the object they were told about rather than the original sketch. So, novices often draw their idea of a face, 
rather than how it actually looks. They overemphasize features to which the human brain pays more attention. Eyes, for example, appear much more prominent than other details. In fact, 95% of untrained artists will depict faces with oversized eyes near the top of the head. But if you look in the mirror, you'll see that your eyes are actually relatively small and placed near the center of your face. To overcome this perceptual bias, effective drawing lessons focus on making students draw what they actually observe. Instead of drawing whole things, students practice by rendering shapes and shadows. At first, these drawings appear very abstract, but as learners fill in the details, their work becomes much more accurate. Link 7 of 7 Meet Patricia. She's lived a rich life, which included a successful career working in French New Wave cinema. After retirement, she moved to the rustic mountain town of Chamonix to ski, play tennis, and relax. Then, at age 70, she wanted something more. She wanted to swim. Now, Patricia was a pack-a-day smoker who'd never swum before. But she was determined. Unable to find a local instructor, she watched tutorials on YouTube. Each night, she would pace her apartment practicing strokes. Each morning, she would head to the pool to test her progress. All that training paid off. After a year, Patricia took a trip to the Greek islands and did something she never thought possible. She swam a kilometer in the crisp waters of the Mediterranean. The key message here is, it's never too late to try something new. Patricia's approach to life is all about continually learning. Even at her age, she regularly challenges herself to try whatever interest strikes her fancy. After taking up swimming, she moved on to two new pursuits, playing pickleball and studying astronomy. Patricia's attitude can serve as a very powerful lesson. As we age, it's important to remain a beginner at something. Another example is David. Growing up, he had many interests. In college, he studied philosophy, architecture, and economics. Afterward, he indulged his love of nature and dabbled in being a park ranger. Finally, as an adult, he took an apprenticeship as a jewelry maker. For three years, he spent hours mastering the traditional crafting techniques and eventually became an expert. However, even as a certified expert at handcrafting jewelry, he didn't just coast on his success. The world of making had gone digital, so David jumped right in. He learned the art of computer-aided design and began to use complex drafting software like Rhino. These digital skills, combined with his aptitude for manual work, opened up a whole new field of creativity. Now, he's able to create things he couldn't have even imagined in the past. So, if you're feeling in a rut, remember that there's always something new to learn. Discover what opportunities exist near you. Check your local papers, go on Google, or simply ask your neighbor. You may find yourself trying a cooking class, learning to weld, or discovering the joy of birdwatching. You never know what you'll learn next. As the Greek philosopher Seneca once said, it takes a whole life to learn how to live. You've just listened to our Blinks to Beginners by Tom Vanderbilt. The key message Blinks is that often Adults become content with their accomplishments and stop learning new skills. Moreover, our society disparages being a beginner as something only fit for children. Yet, continually challenging yourself to take on new interests and hobbies is a fantastic way to keep your brain alert. Developing a new skill or cultivating a new talent makes you see the world and yourself in a different light. And this will keep you happy and engaged as you age. Want some more actionable advice? Learn something pointless. There's a lot of pressure to only spend time acquiring marketable skills like coding. However, 
there's a certain value in learning something just because it brings you joy. Never feel guilty if you spend time on a hobby, even if it's not professional. Learn to fly a kite, dance, or speak a new language. Why? Just because you enjoy it. Moro F. Guillen, 2030. How today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything. Narrated by Alex Vincent and Thomas Florio. What does the future hold? In these uncertain, turbulent times, it's a more pressing question than ever before. Arriving at a single certain answer is, of course, impossible. But we can make informed predictions. Which is where these blinks come in. Extrapolating from a range of current trends, they offer a possible preview of the changes we can expect to see in the coming decade, and paint a picture of the kind of world we're likely to live in come 2030. So, what is life like in 2030? In a word, different. Over the next 10 years, rising temperatures will threaten our predominantly urban, coastal way of life. A low birth rate combined with higher life expectancy will make baby boomers into a powerhouse demographic. And some national economies will stagnate, while others will unexpectedly thrive. To anticipate the challenges and embrace the opportunities the next decade will bring, you'll need to be informed about what the future holds. Blink one of eight. In 1968, professors Paul and Anne Ehrlich released the provocatively titled book Population Bomb. The Ehrlichs argued that if the human race kept procreating at its current rate, it was only a matter of time before humans would overrun the planet. Fast forward more than 50 years, and many are still alarmed by the prospect of overpopulation. But rather than a baby boom, our biggest worry come 2030 might be a baby drought. The key message here is, the decreasing birth rate will forever change human demographics. Since the 1970s, women in the U.S. have had, on average, fewer than two children each. In other words, fewer than necessary to replace the current generation. What's wrong with that? A dwindling population might be good news for the planet's overtaxed resources, but our current economic system relies on the next generation to care for the elderly and foot the bill for pensions through their taxes. Now, all over the world, from Brazil to Japan, governments are questioning who, exactly, will support their aging populations in the coming decades. Why is the birth rate declining? Well, these days women are more active in the world workforce. So they're likely to defer starting a family until they're established in their chosen field. Fertility declines with age, so women who start their families later in life tend to have fewer children. We're also having less sex. A study by the Archives of Sexual Behavior found that in the 2010s, Americans had sex on average nine times less per year than they did in the 1990s. Why? It's partly because technology has brought a host of enjoyable distractions into our homes. Sex is just one pastime among many we can indulge in on a rainy night. Not every country's birth rate is on the decline. The African continent has a current population of 1.3 billion. That's projected to rise to 2 billion by 2038 and 3 billion by 2061, with the boom concentrated in the sub-Saharan region. The African baby boom will have two key flow-on effects. First, sub-Saharan Africa relies on imported food. As its population grows, the markets for feeding and developing agriculture in the region will grow too, potentially becoming a trillion-dollar sector, according to the World Bank. Second, many Western nations will need to rethink their hardline stances on immigration. They may soon be dependent on immigrant workers from the global south to fund and care for their swelling ranks of retirees. Blink two of eight. The Netherlands, 1891. 
Frederick and Gerard Phillips, a father and son team, co-found the electronics company Phillips. Thanks to a series of innovative inventions, amongst them tungsten filament light bulbs, the electric razor, the VCR, and the CD, Philips stays relevant and profitable through most of the 20th century. This changes in the 1990s, when Philips is suddenly undercut by cheaper Asian-manufactured electronics. In the 2000s, the ailing company flirts with bankruptcy. Philips might have folded entirely if Franz von Houten hadn't taken the helm in 2011. He shifted Philips' focus to healthcare technology like scanners and imagers. Thanks in part to the world's aging population, these products are now in high demand. And that demand will likely continue to grow. Here's the key message. Aging consumers will have more spending power than ever before. Van Houten saw in 2011 what many companies still haven't grasped. That the world's aging population, or gray market, represents an enormous financial opportunity for firms. Currently, people 60 years and older, that's baby boomers born between 1944 and 1964, and the silent generation born between 1925 and 1943, hold over half of the world's wealth. By 2030, there'll be another 400 million more people in the 60-plus age bracket worldwide. This cohort is predicted to retire later than its predecessors, meaning they'll accrue even more wealth. To maintain the economy and stay in business, corporations need to tap this spending power. Surprisingly, they seldom do. In fact, 96% of UK nationals over the age of 50 report feeling ignored by corporations and advertisements. To capitalize on this demographic shift, businesses need to speak to the 60-plus cohort in a targeted, aspirational way and tailor products and services to them. Unfortunately, they're not an easy market to court. Their age means they've likely seen it all when it comes to advertising. Anticipating their changing needs and preferences will pay off, though. There's a market, for example, for fashionable shoes that offer orthopedic support, and for stylish appliances modified to suit changing physical capabilities. A front-loading washing machine might be manageable for a user in his 70s, but impossible for that same user once he's in his 80s. The lesson is simple. To take care of the economy, take care of seniors. Blink 3 of 8 Ask any economist and she'll tell you. The middle classes are the engine of the economy. Neither affluent nor impoverished, they are steady, if cautious, consumers. And it's their steady spending that keeps the economic wheels spinning. And yet, in Europe and America, the middle classes, once robust, are stagnating. Many traditional middle class jobs have been automated or outsourced. But that's not the case everywhere. Over a hundred million people join the middle classes each year. And by 2030, the middle classes in Asia, excluding Japan, will account for half of global consumer spending power. The key message is this. By 2030, the middle classes will have shifted dramatically. In 2030, we'll essentially see a tale of two middle classes unfolding. In Asia and the developing world, the middle classes will be booming. And continuing the current global trend, far fewer people will be living below the poverty line. That's a global net benefit. Meanwhile, companies based in the developing world, like Chinese e-commerce site Alibaba or ride-sharing platform Didi, will be poised to become global powerhouses. Unless U.S. and European companies that want to crack those same markets can adjust to the culturally inflected preferences of this new middle class, however, their outlook is far bleaker. Walmart's entry into the developing world illustrates the dangers of an unthinking expansion into a new market. In South Korea, the supermarket chain sold bulk packaged items, apparently unaware of the Korean consumer's preference for purchasing in smaller quantities. In Brazil, where there are no ski slopes to be found, they sold skis. Needless to say, Walmart's expansion was not a success. 
While the emergent middle classes will become wealthier, they're also predicted to accrue more debt as they acquire the typical middle class trappings of home and car and display their status through luxury goods. What's more, this upward trend in consumption will leave the globe with even more waste to process than now. In the US and Europe, however, the middle classes may continue to shrink. According to the Pew Research Center, in 1971 there were 80 million US households considered middle class, while 52 million were either wealthy, working class, or impoverished. In 2015, there were 121.3 million middle class households while 120.8 million households were not. So, while there are technically more middle-class households, proportionally the middle class has shrunk dramatically. The developing world once viewed the Western middle-class lifestyle as aspirational. By 2030, this perspective may well have reversed. Blink 4 of 8 In 2008, the collapse of the investment bank Lehman Brothers signaled the start of a global recession. But what if it had been Lehman Sisters instead of Lehman Brothers? Would the bank have gone under? Perhaps not. A study of male and female brokers at an investment bank showed that the female brokers were more cautious, while the men took more risks. Why is that important? Well, come 2030, women will hold more than half the world's wealth for the first time. And global spending habits will change as a result. Spending will likely increase in sectors such as education, healthcare, and insurance, where women have typically been bigger spenders than men. In investing, women will lead the trend for safer investments, like indexed stock funds. This is the key message. Women will hold the purse strings in 2030. So what brings about this shift in women's spending power? Currently, women are active in the workforce but still face significant obstacles to advancement and wealth. If a woman is also a primary caregiver, she can expect to lose a few years of work and lose out on the corresponding salary. A University of Chicago study found a female MBA who takes three or more years off work could find her salary has dwindled by approximately 40% compared with those of her male counterparts. But the coming decade brings good news for working women. Thanks to our aging population and low birth rate, the pool of qualified workers will shrink. That means businesses will rely on working mothers more than ever. In fact, this is already happening in Japan, a country with one of the world's lowest birth rates. For years, highly qualified Japanese women were tacitly expected to leave their jobs after they had children. Now they're returning to the workforce because there simply aren't enough young workers to take their places. A record 71% of working-age women in Japan are now in full-time employment. And it seems that this shift in gender power dynamics is one we'll be ready for. A recent Gallup poll shows we're increasingly positively disposed toward women in positions of power. In 1953, Gallup asked survey respondents if they would prefer a male boss or a female boss. 66% preferred a male boss. A mere 4% preferred a female boss. Gallup has posed this question every year since then. In 2017, 23% preferred a male boss and 21% preferred a female boss, while the remainder were neutral. Blink 5 of 8 Paris, New York, Delhi, Shanghai, London. The world's major metropolises are hotbeds of art, culture, and finance, as well as inequality, pollution, and, well, actual heat. It's true, cities are warming at faster rates than rural areas thanks to their high concentrations of concrete and asphalt. These materials trap heat, which in turn increases global warming. They're also hubs for consumption, construction, and traffic. In fact, the globe's cities are responsible for 75% of energy use and 80% of carbon emissions. Climate change will undoubtedly be felt more keenly in cities. Cities account for only 1% of the world's land, yet 55% of the world's population lives in them. Moreover, 75% of cities are on or near a coast, making them vulnerable to rising sea levels. 
Asian megametropolises like Jakarta and Bangkok are especially at risk. Elsewhere, Venice, New Orleans, and Miami face immediate threat. So what can cities do to mitigate the coming climate crisis? Here's the key message. To weather the coming climate crisis, city living needs to transform. The good news is that if city dwellers make a few small adjustments to their behavior, they can bring about change for the better. But getting people to renounce old, eco-unfriendly habits is hard. The solution? Cities can incentivize their citizens to make more eco-minded choices. Credit card facilities on buses and cheaper fares, for example, would make public transport not just an eco-friendly choice, but a cheap and convenient one, too. Another solution could be cities growing their own food. Urban agriculture can diminish the carbon footprint that comes from transporting food into urban centers and bolsters urban greenery, which in turn soaks up more carbon emissions. In Singapore, urban agriculture schemes are already in place. The firm Sky Greens grows commercial quantities of lettuce and spinach in vertical gardens in urban towers. Thanks to clean tech, each tower has a negligible carbon footprint and costs approximately $3 per month to maintain. A bonus? In economically depressed cities, vertical gardening can make use of abandoned buildings and bring industry and jobs back into the city center. Despite the climate threat they pose, our urban centers continue to grow inexorably. By 2030, over 400 cities will have more than a million inhabitants. Over the next decade, Cities must encourage behavioral change and embrace green initiatives like vertical gardening or face dire consequences. Blink 6 of 8 Remember the cartoon series The Jetsons? It was first released in 1962, but is set in the year 2062 where it followed the adventures of a futuristic family, the Jetsons. Father and husband George zipped off to work every day in a flying car, while his wife Jane delegated household chores to the robot housekeeper. By the year 2030, we might not be commuting in flying cars, but we can expect lots of exciting technological developments in the next 10 years. The key message is, prepare for rapid technological change in the coming decade. Unlike Jane Jetson, we may not have robot housekeepers, but robots and other similar modes of artificial intelligence are already in widespread use. In the US, bots have taken over the duties of 2 million workers. By 2030, manufacturers will employ more programmers than laborers. What do the next 10 years hold for AI tech? Well, robots will move into more cognitive fields. In 2030, law clerks and teachers may well have robot colleagues. Notably, so will surgeons. In fact, in 2016, a bot successfully performed surgery on a pig's small intestine. In the next decade, 3D printing will also come into its own. All kinds of things, from plastic parts to dental supplies, will be printed rather than manufactured. Coastal areas hit hard by global warming might use 3D-printed seawalls to stave off rising tides and 3D-printed artificial reefs to bolster fish populations. In China, some companies are already printing entire homes in an innovation that spells good news for disaster relief efforts. Of course, while many in the developed world look forward to the future, in other parts of the globe people's lives resemble the 19th century more than the 21st. In the developing world where many houses have no access to sewers, they can have no indoor flushing toilets. Without toilets, people are dependent on pit latrines, which are a health and hygiene hazard. In fact, approximately 1.5 million children die every year due to contaminated water or inadequate sanitation. For these people, perhaps the most profound technological development won't be a new product, but a riff on an old one. The waterless toilet. This innovative toilet is already being manufactured by the startup firm Luwat. It captures waste in a biodegradable film, which is then sealed and collected. The waste is then used to generate electricity. This simple technological innovation may have the most profound impact of all on the world's population.
Blink 7 of 8. If you've ever observed kindergartners playing with buckets and spades in the sandpit, you'll know it's true. Sharing doesn't always come naturally. But by 2030, we'd better have gotten used to it. The sharing economy is on the rise. Soon, we're all going to own less and share more. Imagine having a home on every continent or a car in every city you visit. The only catch is they're not yours, or not just yours. You're one of many people who pays a fee to access them. Does that bother you? If the answer is no, you could well be a millennial or a Gen Zer. Statistics show that you value lifestyle over property and are far more likely than your parents to see the value in paying a low price to use a product rather than paying a high price to own a product. Here's the key message. Get used to sharing instead of owning. The sharing economy is nothing new. In the early 21st century, ride-sharing platforms like Uber and home-sharing platforms like Airbnb have gone from upstart ventures to household names. And we shouldn't have been so surprised at their success. These early sharing platforms rode a market wave arising at the nexus of new mobile app technologies and a shift in consumer habits. By 2030, half our average spending will be on collaborative consumption, leveraging services that allow us to use a product, whether that's a song, a car, or even a workspace, without owning it. And we won't just be sharing assets like bikes or camping equipment. We'll be sharing workspaces with a mixture of firms and free. Freelancers will be paying each other's expenses via crowdfunding, and we'll be financing each other's home loans and college educations through peer to peer lending. In the process, we'll bypass institutions like banks and real estate agencies. It all sounds rather utopian, yes? Well, there may be some drawbacks. Sharing platforms are all about flexibility. That's great for their consumers, but might be bad for their employees. By employing flexible temp and freelance workers, companies like Uber avoid giving their workers critical benefits like paid time off, health insurance, or retirement plans. Despite these critical gaps for workers, the positive potential of sharing is huge. Sharing cuts down on possessions, and fewer possessions mean less overconsumption. Sharing might just help save the planet if we learn to do it well. Blink 8 of 8 Late in the 13th century, the intrepid Italian explorer Marco Polo ventured to China. He was the first European to set foot there. He saw lots of amazing things that hadn't yet arrived in Europe, like gunpowder and porcelain. But the thing that really blew his mind? Paper money. The explorer observed it being exchanged with great solemnity, as if it were pure gold or silver. 